Hey, it's Kathy with Rocky Retirement. And as promised, today's Friday, and so you'll be getting to listen to Henry Shapiro's Retired Excited. I know you're just going to love this as much as I do. And don't forget, you can still listen to Rock Your Retirement, where I'm the host, and those shows are released on Mondays. Welcome to the Retired Excited Podcast. Retired Excited, the show where we give retired and want to be retired folk a look at how great retired life can be. Here we talk to men and women who are happily retired and loving their life. We explore the techniques, activities, beliefs, and excitement of these happy retirees and examine how every Tom, Dick, and Mary can benefit from their experience. Together, we will delve into what retired happiness really looks like and how anyone can achieve it. Here is your host, Henry Shapiro. Hey folks, Henry here at Retired Excited, the show providing inspiration for people who are nearly retired, newly retired, or say they're never going to retire. If you're nearing retirement and fearful of what lies ahead, you don't need to be. If you're already retired and wondering how to fill your days, then this show is exactly for you. Here we talk to retired people doing things that make them happy. Things from stamp collecting to cruising, from dancing to touring the world on a motorbike. There's an exciting stage of life to be enjoyed after full-time work and it's got nothing to do with your financial situation or social position. We talk to everyday retired people who are living the life they want and we talk to a few professionals to get expert advice. And I chip in with some of my own experiences. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Retired Excited. We're going to meet a lady today who I think is a bit special. Her name is Rosemary Savage. When I said to her, can I interview you, please? She said, why me? There's nothing special about me. I'll leave that for you guys to judge. She lived with her husband, Keith, for probably half a century. I'm not quite sure how long they lived together. But unfortunately, Keith uh, has now died. Keith had a pretty good job, but he wasn't a super high flyer. And Rosemary was, for most of her time, a stay-at-home mum. Why, you ask? Because she had six children. She worked before she got married, and then later on did a few bits and pieces of part-time work. But what's really extraordinary about them is that without any particular training, they did all the right things. Keith, as he came towards retirement, planned for his retirement. He got some financial advice before he retired. He knew innately not to rush into his retirement, but just to take things easy at the start. And he undertook that he'd take three months off, doing virtually nothing, until he got his feet. Now, Keith has passed on about a year ago, and Rosemary has carried on the things that they began together. And what sort of things? Well, even before he retired, Rosemary and Keith had decided that they were going to spend some of their time devoted to various charity organisations, and they wanted to travel. They used their retirement to fulfil that dream, and they went on to see almost every bit of Australia. Both Keith and Rosemary in their early days were keen tennis players, and even now, and you'll see that uh, Rosemary is not a youngster anymore. She, t- she tells us what her age is. She's still intimately involved with tennis and at every opportunity goes to the Davis Cup matches here in Melbourne and the Australian Open. Given her age, she is a really fit woman. She could walk endlessly. She's uh, just a fabulous mother who's done some terrific things, brought up six great kids and, well, Let's have her tell you the story. Let's have a talk to her. Hi there, Rosemary. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. (laughs) I want to start, Rosemary, by asking you about your background. Yes. There goes Big Ben. That'll come through. (laughs) That's fine. Doesn't matter. Uh, Rosemary, what did you do early in life? I was worked in an office. Mm -hmm. Did the normal office things, switchboard, bookwork, 
serving and people at the counter. Okay. What sort of a company um, was it? In a, in a high, company? well, it was a furniture store. Okay. But we were in the office, so there was a lot of um, accounts, high purchase people. So all that book work had to be done, as well as serving people every month. The books had to be done. Okay. So all of that type of work. Time went by. You met the man of your dreams. Yes, where I worked. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. We met, didn't you? No. There you go. You don't know everything about me now. <laughs> Secrets roughly, will come out. <laughs> roughly how old were you when you got married? Uh, 22. 22 and, and a little bit, but 22. Bit, yes, mm-hmm. yes. A couple of months. And subsequently had a number of children. So how old were you when your first child was born? One year after, nine months after I was nine. married, to be exact. <laughs> right. <laughs> was that a joyous occasion for you? Yes. Yeah. It was what I I'd hoped would happen, so okay. it did. And subsequently, mm. had more kids. How many kids did you There's have? There's six children. Mm. So four boys and two girls. Uh-huh. And was tell me how you felt about that and how your husband Keith felt about that. Well, I guess we expected to have children. We always wanted probably four. Right. I was hoping for two of each, but that didn't <laughs> quite work out. As three boys came first, uh, yeah, three boys first, then two girls, and then another boy. So it didn't quite work out okay. how I wanted it in that sense of the word. Plus there was five children close together in seven years. Yes, yes. And then a huge gap What's of, huge? Not, of nine years. Okay. In between that, I had a miscarriage. Uh-huh. So the kids are all grown up now? They are all grown up. There's 20 grandchildren. Gracious me. And 20 great-grandchildren, with another one expected, another great-grandchild expected this month. So that makes you over 40? Yeah, a little bit over 40. (laughs) Just a tad over 40. (laughs) Try doubling that one. (laughs) Okay, is that right? You're you're in your 80s or you're 80? I'm 81. 81. Well, that's interesting because as we talk on people will understand what's possible, what some people consider to be later in life. To me, just a chicken, but there you go. So you're working along, You is this correct to say? Well, that I you, left work, you when, work I got, yeah. when I was pregnant. Yes. Um, and didn't go to work until after a number five child went to school. You went back to work? Yeah, but only as in um, house work. Okay. Actually going to cook meals for an elderly couple okay. who they wanted somebody to cook meals a couple of times a week. So I went to do that. What, did you enjoy doing that? Well, I was, I was actually approached. So I probably wasn't something I would have looked for, but I was approached to do it. And I thought, oh, I suppose I could manage now that they're at school. And this only involved 10 till 2. So it was easily Fitting. worked in with children at school. And yeah. still able for me to do everything I had to do at home. Um, at that stage, there was five children, so. Yep. Um, a dollar's a dollar. Anything yeah, helps, and I it? quite, I quite enjoyed it, to mm-hmm. a degree. They were a very nice couple, um, so I was quite happy to do that. Yeah. And what was Keith doing? What, as we get closer to retirement now, Keith Keith, been, Keith's retirement. What sort of work? He was in the computer industry. And what was he doing? Moving from big mainframes to PCs. I think he worked for a company... He worked 32 years with the same company. Goodness me, yes. Um, which was uh, an ACI company, which then the computer area branched out into its own sideline. Yeah. Uh, because he originally worked in the ACI, in the fibreglass part of ACI. Yeah. Was asked to go into the computer side of it because he was in the office side. He yes. was asked would he like to go into the computer side and that's where that started and that's where it ended. Did he retire voluntarily or did he hit the retirement no, age? Had, how, did, how did that work? He had always said he would retire at 65. And that's what After happened? After his 65th birthday, he had always made up his mind. Well, about 60, he had made up his mind that's what he wanted to do. Listeners, here in Australia, 65 at that time certainly was the common retiring age. I think that's, that's probably right. when the pension kicked in and that's why people concentrated on 65. Mm. Uh, now things are a bit different as uh, the government 
realise that they're going to have trouble funding retirement. They've that, moved the age up and up gradually. Yep. But anyhow, at that time it was 65. Yeah, that's, that's... I mean, it wasn't just that it was... It just meant that that's the age that he could. Yeah. And we felt that we could manage that uh, because our intention was to travel, do some travelling. So am I right in saying that as you moved towards him being 65... Um, he was pleased about that? He was looking yes, forward to it? Yes, no, he had, yeah, he was. He couldn't wait for the day to come. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and I, and I uh, he was looking forward to it. I probably was, um, I wasn't really apprehensive because I knew that basically after three months, he said, I want three months of just, you know, realising that I am retired, just pottering the dark garden, whatever things we wanted to do, then we'd plan to... Travel. Travel. So the actual retirement itself, what happened? Did he? Did they give him a gold watch? What, what no, happened? No, 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 he just had a uh, lunch. Lunch with the, one of the bosses and or whatever? With the group that, you know, it's a big co- it was a big company yes, at that stage. Yeah. So just with the ones that, because he'd been with the company so long, there was older ones that he, like, that had been with the company for a long time. Um, he just had a lunch. Remember, I was invited, so... Was he worried about your finances after retirement? Uh, no, because for the previous few years we had begun to, we had spoken to a financial advisor prior to that, mm-hmm. knowing what sort of money we would have that was there. Right. Which wasn't a lot because, as you know, in that eight era, superannuation was not. Yes. Uh, Compu- not even, wasn't compulsory. In wasn't those days. compulsory, no. and certainly in the early stages with a large family, we didn't have any money to be putting away. Yes, yeah. Um, so really, probably, he, we, he knew in about six, when he was 62 that this is what the aim was, to leave at 65. So we went a few years, I can't remember, two or maybe two, and a bit years before that, to somebody who uh, he was advised through the company. So it was through the company that they had somebody they could advise you to go to, who we did, and she looked at what, you know, laid our cards on the table about what we had and didn't have, yep. um, and she said, no, it shouldn't be a problem, you know, there's ways and means that you can make that money work for you. I mean, so, we didn't understand all that, no. so that was a learning thing, and we were quite pleased with what we could see would, would happen. I, I did remiss to telling you that I did have a part-time job when Nicholas started at the college. Nicholas is your... That's the last child. Last child. His secondary college I'm talking about. I, just prior to that, there was a cleaning job going at the school, which only involved something like 15 hours a week. So I I took that job before Keith finished work. Okay. When he finished, he, he used to help me anyway, he became employed as well, and we both did it until we began travelling, which was mm, the year 2000. So he okay, finished so work in 97. Right. I didn't finish work till 2000. And he used to help you with the cleaning job? And he job. used to help me, yeah. In part of that, he also wanted to be a... He wanted to do voluntary work from the time he retired. He wanted three months off and then he was asked to do work through the Red Cross, which was taking people to their medical appointments. So just explain how that worked. What, what did he actually physically do? He, um, in liaison with, with the local Berwick area, uh, they phone and they look for drivers that might take people to their appointments that they, haven't, they can't drive, they're not well enough to drive. A lot of the times it's in the city, so people don't want to travel to the city themselves. So he would just be told, you know, pick whatever their names are up at their home and take them to their appointment and bring them home again. He did that for a little while with Red Cross, then transferred to the city of Casey and did exactly the same work. And you say he had wanted to do that. What was his motivation in wanting to do that? Because he wanted to do something. He, he didn't want to just garden and sit around. Okay. And we certainly didn't have the money to constantly travel. So it was something that he'd always wanted to do. So leading... I'll just go back a bit. Leading up to retirement, um, you got your finances in order. 
he retired, your expectation was that you were going to travel and he was going to do a bit of voluntary work. Is that the way it worked out? Pretty much so, because we'd set that I, we would, he did his voluntary work. I was still working till 2000. Um, that money really was holiday money that I actually earned. That went into a separate account and that was kept for holidays. Okay. Um, I always so wanted to do voluntary work, but as I've never driven on account of I don't have good eyesight, uh, he said, well, we'll do, I'll do Meals on Wheels as well. That gave me the opportunity to do my volunteer work. So let's talk about Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. Which we started in 2001. There'd be listeners here because not all the listeners are in Australia. They could be in Iceland, not understanding what Meals on Wheels is. Can you just explain what it is? Uh, Meals on Wheels is a service provided by most councils for people who, can't, who are incapacitated, um, not well enough to cook for themselves or that type of thing. And through councils, meals are provided at a small cost and they have to be delivered, which is delivered by volunteers. So am I right in saying that the meals arrive somewhere at some central point? Yes. The volunteers go and pick them up? That's right. And drive meals them? Meals arrive at a central point, volunteers go there and the coordinator there has everything ready for you. They're all refrigerated, they're in an icebox, refrigerated esky, if you like to call it eskies, um, and your particular round, which there's a lot of volunteers, so we all have a small round which allows us to do probably 10 to 12 people. It's so all packed in there, you have a, it's all done you know, you have to go through, you can't just be, you've got to go through a police check all done by the council before you can even become That's a good, volunteer. Isn't it? Because, yes, you don't want just anybody going no, into elderly people's homes. because you're going to their homes. Generally, a lot of the times you're going into their homes because they might be, have walkers and things and can't, they can come to the door but they can't carry. Yes. So they might want you to put it in the fridge or help them with something, um, and you're told that you might be the only person that's, you're the only visitor to that home on any given day. So some people are very lonely, they don't have families around them that can pop in and call. A lot of them are in retirement villages, a lot of them are still in their own homes. Are they pleased to see you every day? Yes, some are exceptionally pleased to see you, others are a little reserved, but generally speaking, some of them are really, really happy to see you and have a chat. Is it right to say that you would generally see the same people, you have a, the same round? We have the same rounds each week. You have, we do, I did two different rounds, one a different round each Wednesday. So you see the same people generally, unless there's a new client on the books, but generally you see the same people. But that's only one day in the week. Those people could be getting meals three or four times in the week. So they don't just see me, they see the other volunteers as well. Some of them are not all that good at remembering your name, but that okay. doesn't matter. You have your name tag on you, um, but some of them know your face and it's really nice to, for us to be recognised as well. So you are doing this one day a week, is that correct? That's right. I imagine that seeing these people, and you'd see, particularly if you're doing it for a long time, how long were you doing this for? We started in 2001. And That's did 15, it up? Coming up 15 years. Okay, so you would see these people progress. Most of them, or I imagine that most of them would be elderly people. Yes, and, and we've, in the course of all that, we've lost some very special people. I was going to say, I imagine that they would... Um, you become good friends with me. Sometimes you become uh, very attached. Yes. You advise not to, be, you, you, to become too attached, but you can't help it. If you see the same people all the time, and then one week when you go in, you find that those people are They've gone off to hospital on. or gone They've to... gone to hospital, they can't be in their home anymore, or they've passed away. And that's um, sometimes pretty sad to have lost them because you've become part of their life over five, six years or whatever. Yes. 
Yes. So, yeah, that's, so, that's not good because mm, it's hard for me to say, but sometimes they can be just the nicest people. Yes, and I imagine there's some less than nice people as well. Well, so. some are. <laughs> but oh, they're all nice. Yes. Some are a little more <laughs> friendly and... I um, can't think of the word that I yeah, should friendly. say. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Some are just somehow you you gel with some people yes. a little more than others. Yes. And those people, uh, are, you know, end up being really, really, you become really good friends in the course of that, of which we're supposed to stand off a bit, but it's very hard not to be friends when sometimes those people don't have anybody. Yes. Not and constantly. You said that in some cases you might be the only person they see all day. That's right. Mm. Because you get talking to people, particularly at maybe Easter and Christmas, like are you going to your family or is somebody coming to bring you dinner and take you or take you to their families? Some of them are not going anywhere. Did you enjoy that part of, uh, you know, the co contact with people? And yes, so? I do. Yeah. I like that very much. Now, you said that um, you don't drive because no, you, I don't. you've got crook eyes. Mm -hmm. Keith passed away less than a year ago and mm -hmm. you don't drive, but I know that you've continued doing Meals on Wheels. How are you working that out? Well, when I wasn't able to do meals when Keith got sick and had to be looked after, um, I missed that contact because I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, my daughters decided that they would be the drivers, so they take it in turns week about to let me still do what I love doing. That's terrific. Mm. And it ensures... And I'm very grateful for that. And it ensures you see your kids. That's right. <laughs> well, I did see them anyway. The girls I did see. They, they're not far from me, so it was good. But they took it upon themselves without my knowledge in the beginning to go and see Casey about doing it um, and then told me that I could still continue. So I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. I'm not sure how... <laughs> and much younger than me, they... Uh, they uh, well, they seem to get a kick out of it, I have to say. Sometimes they, they're quite good about it. Do you they think don't think it's such a chore. They, they enjoy. They enjoy doing it, although they're, uh, what are they? They must be in their Well, 40s. they're only in their early 50s. Early 50s. Mm. Very early 50s, actually. I'll be careful what I say about them. <laughs> do you yeah. think that uh, when you're no longer able to do it, that they will continue? Well, I, I'm not sure. I can't say about that one because... Oh. Uh, I think they're doing it, their, their idea for doing it was more for me. I see. Because they knew that I was really fond of doing it. Yes. Um, and I always, Keith and I always said that we would do these things while we were able uh, because we don't know what's down the track for us. So. Yes. Um, and, and I can't do a lot with not driving, so that's one thing I can do. Whether they go on doing it, well, that might be another story. That might depend on how long I keep going doing it. Yes. Did you have, do you have much contact with the other Meals on Wheels drivers? Uh, yes, we, we do see quite a few of them that get to the kitchen at the same time that we do. We also have quarterly sort of uh, get-together, volunteer get-together, meeting, come social morning coffee or something like that. So you do get to see other drivers and then you have an end of year function where you will see most volunteers who wish to go. And are most of them doing one day a week or do some of them do more or do oh, you no, get to some, choose? Oh no, some do three and four days. Okay, that's a, a, a big commitment really. Yes, right. well they're quite a few of, well some of the ones I know, they are widowed or widower. Um, and they feel, what else will they do? Mm -hmm. So they're very happy to do two, three, sometimes four times a week. When you, you think about the people you know who are at those meetings, mm -hmm. what do you think that the volunteers get out of being part of it? Ah, helping others, exactly what I said. Being able to do something for somebody that's in a lesser position than you. Okay. Let's just move on from that. Mm -hmm. You said you had another... Uh, interest when, as you came up to retirement, and that was travel. Mm -hmm. What sort of travel are we talking about? Do you hike? Do you camp? Do you go on uh, flash cruises? 
tell us what you do. What no, travel, no, what no does flash travel cruises. Mean? Does we didn't mean? have that sort of um, <laughs> money. I wish. Um, no, we decided to. Um, we first thought we would just travel. We case wanted to travel around Australia. Wasn't interested in going out of the country. Needs be. I would go anywhere, but he only wanted to be within the country. Um, we first thought it wouldn't be too difficult to travel around till we realised motels and things would be very costly. So we purchased a caravan. A big van? What was it like? No, quite small, mm-hmm. not expensive, just a basic camper in the beginning. Um, and did our first trip in 2000, travelling for five months before we returned for five home. months, that's serious. Mm-hmm. Yes. And where did you go? We went um, north. We went South Australia, Northern Territory, to Darwin. Did all the normal touristy things in the area, parks, etc. Then we travelled to the west, went right down the west coast. Um, we had friends at that time in Perth, so we spent some time catching up with them at the same time. And came back across the Nullarbor and were away five months. And it, the very first trip that we did was five months. It did not rain one day until we got to Ballarat on the night before we got home. Ballarat, folks, is about 100, Which, 100 kilometres out of yeah, Melbourne. that's right. Yes. So, so you've done... That was very fortunate. We thought it was wonderful because the weather was just terrific all the time. And you've done maybe, I don't know, 10,000 kilometres then? Or oh, so, so well, a, I, yeah, a long I, way, anyhow. It was all written down at one stage, yeah. and, and I have got a book where Keith kept notes about everything, so it's all written down Yes. about where we went, what places we saw, people we met, whatever, and then continued to do that every year. So you obviously loved it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm. And what was good about travelling? Ah, just seeing the country, seeing places that you never thought you would ever get to see, going from, you know, the north part of the country to the coast when you're up that end and then right on the south coast, West Coast, East Coast, uh, I just thought it was all magic. Then you said that you, you did that again the next year and then next we year... We did that every year till 2006. So were they such extended periods in all those trips? Um, they were usually... Some were a little shorter because it depended on where we went. If we just did the Flinders Ranges, that was a much shorter time away. For, uh, give us uh, an idea of how long. Which is, well, might have been a month or six weeks. I see. Um, but generally it was three to four months. If we went to the west, went, went north and to the west, we did um, probably about three months, we did two or three Queensland trips right up to the, didn't get quite to the tip, but went as far as Cooktown to the Gulf, came right down the coast, two or three holidays we probably did, Queensland maybe three years. Each, you... each winter we used to go. Before the winter set in, about end of May, June, we would go and not come back till about October. Did you go in convoy with other people? With no. Those? You went by no, yourselves? No, it was something we were told by some friends not to do. By all means, meet up with people. Don't travel with them because you'll end up getting disappointed about what they want to do, what you want to do, and everybody doesn't agree. And so did you But we did travel with friends for a little while, uh, people that we met who we stayed friends with and still are friends with in the very first trip, but didn't travel constantly with them, just met up when places they got to and they, they would contact us and say, where are you? And we'd go, oh, we're two days away. Oh, we'll wait for you and we would have a, a day together. But no, we did not travel in convoy or with anybody at any of the trips. So you was, uh, have you made friends, like permanent friends from people you yes, met we on have. the road? Yeah? Yeah. Friends from South Australia, friends from Western Australia, friends from Queensland that we met in our travels and have kept in touch with. What was the best thing about being on the road? Oh, too many things to answer. It was just... Are there, any, are there any little incidents that you can relate to us about what happened? 
It's <laughs> probably too many. I have to think about that one. There must have been times you ran out of petrol or you... No, no, no. No, no, no that would that. never happen. Keith was too careful about that. Never run out of petrol. <laughs> hit a kangaroo. You did hit a kangaroo. Um, hit a kangaroo and, yeah. Damaged the car? In Queensland, yeah. Knocked the bumper a bit. Um, I, I guess the, probably the really... Uh, we got a flat tyre on the car when we were really in northern Queensland, out back on our way to, name escapes me for the minute, and it was a gravel, we knew we had to go on a gravel road to go to this park, and we got a flat tyre. So we had to re- go back to the campsite that we'd left, which was very, very basic. We were in a horse paddock um, with a buy a shop general store, very basic it was. And so we went back because Keith wasn't prepared to travel for another two days without a spare. So we went back to see if we could, they could order us a tyre because it was one of those general stores come, garages come, everything like a road house type thing. It's the only thing that's in the area. And we had to wait four days to get a tyre from Brisbane. We had a Subaru car. We had to wait four days there for a tyre to come. So that was... um, I guess that wasn't the best time because it wasn't a very good caravan park. It was, we were basically in a paddock. We could walk down to the river, which was very nice, and but nothing else to do. And, of course, nobody else stayed there because they all went to the campsite by the river. So it wasn't... Yeah, not great. Yeah. But we met some lovely people while we were there and they offered to take us on their trip to the park for the day. So we did get to the park that we had planned to see, uh, just because those people were very kind and they offered to take us on a day trip with them. Is that typical of the sort of people you find on the road? Uh, Yes, there's, there's always odd people who are not as friendly, but generally speaking, there is a camaraderie out there of of holiday makers, and especially caravanners. Some can be a little bit, um, yeah, not uh, quite so friendly. At Corumba, where we went, that's on the Gulf. It's a, very, it's a fishing spot. Neither Keith or I are interested in fishing, but we were determined to get to the Gulf, and that's, that's where you have to go to get there. And we got into this caravan park, and they said... There was a lot of other Victorians there, so you, you with a lot of other, it tends to be where they go, if you, especially fishing people. But that we didn't think that would be a problem. And when they said something about fishing, we said, no, we don't fish. They went, well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> so that was a little off-putting because they actually weren't friendly after that. It was a okay. bit like it made you feel as though you actually shouldn't be there. but And that's wrong to feel that way. But you did feel that after that they weren't really that friendly because you weren't with the clan that obviously need to be out there fishing every day. Yes. Did you? So you will strike odd things like that. They're a little off-putting. But that's not very often by the sound of it. No, it's, it's just, not very often, the, but the I know it's happened to others, so yes. it, it can happen. Yeah. doesn't stop you doing what you want to do, though. You just go ahead and do it. That's the point, isn't it? Yes. And You're there in, and you're paying your fees just like anybody else, so you just go life, ahead and do yes. it. In life, you're going to find strange people yes. and good people and all sorts and of people. And there will be the odd hiccup, so you have to get over that one. So other than that, we didn't have actually many hiccups. We were pretty lucky. Were you the sort of uh, caravanners who stayed at caravan parks or did you free camp? And if I just explain free camping for a little... For yeah, I know, I know about free camping, but we couldn't free camp. Mm-hmm. We only had a very small van. We didn't carry generators or anything like that that we could free camp. Free camping, folks, is... Free camping means you need a generator so that you can have a light and, you know, a stove going or things like a fridge going. We couldn't do that without power. So generally you stayed at And caravan. we never wanted to 
Keith never wanted to four-wheel drive. He never wanted to go off-road as such. Yeah. The trips, when we were travelling, we did those by tour companies. I see. We did two or three trips by tour companies, as in off-road. Did because have... he, he didn't want to ever do that himself. So the odd places and things that we definitely wanted to see uh, out of the Alice, Bungle Bungles, um, Beagle Bay, places that we had in our mind we wanted to go to, we did those by uh, tour. How did you feel about the off-roading? I was happy. It, as I didn't drive, it's whatever Keith said was if he wasn't comfortable about having a four-wheel drive or doing any of that's fine by me. Right. What is your attitude towards caravanning? In, let me explain. Um, is it something you think that people generally would enjoy? Or what's the best thing about it? Um, well, it's a funny question because originally Keith was never going to have one simply because he didn't want a tow. But when you realise that you can't do it on a limited amount of money, staying in hotels or motels and eating out most of that time, you realised, I mean, as he said, we can do it, but in 12 or 18 months there won't be any money left to continue doing. So that was the reason we got the caravan. We just got a basic caravan. We didn't get an expensive one, but I think, so I guess from that angle, it was the only way we were going to be able to do it. So we made ourselves like it and found that it was really good. You did it year after year, so... Yeah, we did it for five to six years. After that, uh, we would have gone on, but he got where he couldn't manage to tow and handle the van. Uh, so the trips after that were... We sold the caravan, and the trips after that were just staying in caravan parks, in cabins, and visiting family interstate so he couldn't he had had enough he, he couldn't manage because he suffered from emphysema he couldn't manage with the handling of the van after that and I couldn't do it either he wouldn't let me do it on my own and I don't drive so that was fine by me if he couldn't manage to do that but we did go to quite a few places after that just driving to them and staying in caravan parks and enjoying that. Now, if we talk about people who are coming up to retirement, hmm. what would your advice to them be? Oh, I don't, I, I don't think that I'm in a position to advise because everybody, it's an individual thing. You have to, I guess you have to prepare for it unless suddenly a person gets ill and has to retire immediately or is made redundant and is forced into it with a very short notice. Um, Otherwise, I think you, anybody else should just um, plan for it as best they can, knowing whatever financial situation they're in and what they can do with that. Would you advise people to travel? If that's what they want to do. I've, I can tell you I know there are people who doesn't interest them to travel. Would you advise people to volunteer? Well... It depends what their outside interests are prior to that. They might have played golf, they might have been a bowler, they might have played any number of sports or they might be involved in other clubs of some description. So therefore they're probably going to go on doing that and but just a little more of it. So it's hard to say. A lot of people are not interested in volunteering. People, a lot of people, annoy those who are still at work by saying, oh, I've never been busier then since I've retired. What would you say to that? Um, well, I suppose it's a bit different for me. I was generally home, apart from, you know, a little bit of part-time work. Case always said he was busier because once he started his volunteer work, he, he might have been driving people four days a week. So oh, in really? between... Yeah, he could have had four, four days. He might have been out four days some weeks. Depends how many volunteers and a lot of the volunteers within our area. Some of them did not want to drive people to the city for their appointments. They were happy just to do local work. They did not want to go beyond Dandenong, for instance. Yes. 
They, they weren't interested in travelling into the city to the big hospitals. If I just explain to the listeners that uh, Rosemary lives maybe 40 kilometres from the centre of Melbourne and the Iron Ear Hospital and the major teaching hospitals are in Melbourne and driving in there can be a bit of a nightmare. Yes, so it can, can be. And there's yeah. a lot of people who don't want to be there. Yes. So he keeps never minded driving anywhere. So wherever he had to go, it never worried him. I, I, I don't think... Uh, it's hard to say whether you would tell people to volunteer. It's purely a personal thing. Yeah, we yeah. had people yeah. say to us, I don't know why you would bother to... Um, quite close to me. Why you would bother to be using your vehicle and doing that. And what sort of thing were those people doing? Doing what they want to do, I guess. <laughs> right. Actually, that's a very good spot to, to yes, end the interview. Probably better not <laughs> continue that subject. <laughs> but there are people who don't understand. Yeah. Well, t well. After we turn this off, I'll I'll get all the goss. Don't okay. you worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rosemary, thank you very much. That's for all right. It's, and, it's a uh, pleasure, and um, if it if it helps or <laughs> means anything to anybody, that's fine. Fantastic. Thank you again. I don't know how you feel about it, but to me, Rosemary and Keith are Australian heroes. They're the backbone of what Australia is all about. There's something I didn't ask her about, and I, I just wanted to tell you about now, I'll discuss with you. About eight years prior to Keith's death, the kids convinced them, their children convinced them, to move out of the house. The garden, although they were keen gardeners, the garden was getting to be a bit of a trial for them. And... They'd lived in that house ever since they were married. They'd, they'd lived in the same house, brought their children up in that house, and so they were very, very committed to it. But particularly their two girls convinced them to move into a retirement village. And there was a new village being built uh, nearby, about a couple of kilometres from where they were. So they were able to continue their activities and still be intimately in touch with their friends. And in the end, they did move into the retirement village and they got a really lovely brand new unit, two and a half bedrooms or two bedrooms, and a tiny little study space, beautiful kitchen. Uh, and you know how these retirement villages are. They had all the gardens and everything and looked after. They just had a little plot in the backyard to grow a few vegetables and some daffodils and bits and bobs. And it was the right thing for them to do. It took all the pressure off them. When they wanted to go away on holidays, they could shut the door and know that the place was secure. I'm really impressed with that, and I reckon that's a really good idea. And it's a good idea to do it early so that you're well established there. And as it happened, as I said, Keith has passed away, and Ro Rosemary is well established in the retirement village. She's got friends there. She's still got all her friends from when she lived in her own single house. Now she doesn't have any worries, doesn't have any worry about the garden or security and, and security is a big thing as you get older if you're around 55 60 65 you wouldn't think about it but as you get up to 75 and a bit older security becomes a major issue for you and something that preys on your mind and speaking of preying on your mind you'll see that rosemary or you will have heard that rosemary credits their financial situation with getting sound financial advice before they retired and that, that has given her peace of mind. I think it's really important. The other thing she talks about are the people she met when they were out and about in the caravan. And you heard her say that she developed lasting relationships, friends who they have stuck with her over the years, that she met along the road. She didn't go in convoy with them. She didn't stay with them joined at the hip. But they met and met again. And now wherever she goes in Australia, she, she knows people. I think that's absolutely fabulous. She continued her charity work after Keith died. Why? Not because she had to, not because she felt obligated. She said she continued her charity work because she enjoyed it. Just think about that. She continued it because she enjoyed it. And back to the caravanning, you heard that Keith really wasn't initially enamoured with the idea of, of buying a caravan. He just wanted to see Australia motel to motel or driving about. And they realised... Uh, having gone to the financial advisor that that wasn't a possibility, bought the caravan and loved it. Can you imagine? You, you leave your home. The first trip they did was for five months 
and so obviously they really, really enjoyed it. So here's a couple of people who tried something new. For them it was a, a new experience and they loved it. And what does that tell us? Don't be afraid of stuff. Try it. You never know. It might be horrible. On the other hand, you might love it. So as I said, I think she's a hero, a heroine. I think Rosemary is one of the, the sort of people who is the backbone of Australian society. And what I'd like to do is, what I'd like you to do is to tell me what you think. As always, I'll put up some show notes and some references and our email address. And you can leave, you can leave me a message, a direct message to me on the email address, henry at retiredexcited.com or make a comment on the bottom of the show notes on the website, retiredexcited.com. That's all for today. Hope you thought it was as great as I did. Bye now. I like to give that a go for sure. I'm in. That was terrific. That was interesting. What a good idea.